Okay. Yeah. All right. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Oh, well, thanks for coming along. I know I'm between you and lunch, so thanks for making the time. Um, so my name's Stephen Ice. I work for Red Hat over in New Zealand. Uh, one thing I'm going to do first is give you an idea of the agenda. That way, if you want to leave, you can leave early if this isn't what you're expecting. So just an idea of the things we're going to cover off and then explain why. You know, why are we doing this? Why am I interested in this area? What are we trying to achieve? Uh, there's a little bit of demo, a little bit of walkthrough. Hope you get some value out of it. Please feel free to make this interactive. They have asked that you use the microphones so they can record this. I'm happy to take questions at any point during the talk, not just at the end. So key things we're going to cover. Nested virtualization, how to use thin LVM, some stuff around snapshotting, uh, how to utilize technologies like uh, Red Hat OpenStack or RDO, and what are the difference of, of that versus things like DevStack. Uh, and, and other methods for deploying uh, OpenStack. If we've got time, I'll also cover some stuff around using Atomic for rapidly standing up Docker and Kubernetes environments. So along the way, we're going to talk about how to choose the right kind of base image for building and deploying these environments, making things as reusable as possible. A lot of this is war stories, gotchas, things I hope that you don't get wrong because I've got them wrong and it's, it's not been a pleasant experience. And hopefully a few power tips. Also, I want to get your tips and your feedback during this session. And then at the end, where I want to go next, areas I'm interested in, where I want to play with next, where I'm seeing in the data center. So let's start, who? Me. Uh, Stephen Ellis. I work for Red Hat in New Zealand. So where is that? So all the way down there. This is effectively my patch. I'm part of an APAC Y solution architecture team. My focus is predominantly on New Zealand-based customers and business partners, but I occasionally advise on other projects all within the region. One reason for putting this up is you look at some of the customers, some of the use cases that have already come up this week, you look at the growth of technologies like OpenStack in the APAC region, it is phenomenal at the moment. The things going on in China, the things going on in India. This region has the potential to be generating far more OpenStack and cloud revenue than the entire of the United States, which is currently one of the world's largest markets for this kind of technology. So why do I do this? Why am I trying these technologies out? Why am I here? Occasionally I wonder about that. But, um, I demo and walk through solutions for customers and for business partners on a regular basis. I need a rapid way to stand up an environment, occasionally with limited or no internet connection, around a range of emerging and cloud-centric technologies. So often, I have to use whatever I've got to hand. Also, you know, th this comes up a lot. People say that they've got an itch. You know, why do we get involved with open source? Why do we fix open source? Why do we do these things? And we go, well, we've got an itch we need to scratch. Scratching that might be a patch, it might be a fix, it might be some documentation, a guide, a how-to. But one thing I've realized, because I've realized recently I've been doing this for a long time, I've been in IT for over 20 years, is sometimes you have a scratch that you've forgotten about. It's there, but you have a workaround. You don't fix it. It no longer itches. You have these problems that you live with. I've got a way of doing this, and it's okay. You know, I go into IT organizations and they've got desk procedures rather than using automation because they can live with it. They throw people at the problem. So one thing I want you to take away from this is think about a problem that you live with, that scratch that no longer bothers you enough, right? And along the way, I hope I don't end up teaching you all how to suck eggs, okay? I want to learn from you as well. So that's the other big reason why I give these sessions. I want to learn from the audience. If you've got tips and tricks, in fact, I gave a version of this back in Australia earlier this year, and one of the audience had actually fixed something I've been fighting with. So at the end of the session, we went away and resolved the problem. That was awesome. I had a great outcome. That was a really good session. Also, you may guess from my accent, I'm not originally from New Zealand. I'm actually from Liverpool, which means I have a slightly odd sense of humor. So to make allowances for that, I think we'll just have a quick joke and then some of you will get it, some of you won't, many of you won't, but 
it will hopefully set the tone for the rest of the presentation. So, person of non-specific gender walks into a bar. Ouch. Right, so now we've got that out of the way. <laughs> My mate Gollum. What does he say? He says, what have you got in your pocket? You know, part of the topic of this is cloud in your pocket. How can we use what we have to hand to demo emerging technologies, to demo cloud-centric technologies? If any of you actually bothered to read the, some of the text I put in and associated with this talk, one of the things is you don't always have access to the cloud. I don't always have access to equipment in a data center. I might be working in a secure environment. So how do we deal with this? So what's the first thing you all have in your pocket? A phone. We all have phones. Most of us do, or tablets. You think about the power in your mobile phone today, quad core, octa core, three gig of RAM. Wouldn't it be great if you could, and you can get phones now that get little mini projector add-ons. Wouldn't it be great if you could walk in and demo or show off a range of technology just using your mobile phone. What else? I love these. Raspberry Pis. I was going to bring one with me. Yes, it fits in my pocket. I can't because it's too busy being used by my daughter at home, so she wouldn't be too impressed. I want a couple of these. Plenty of my colleagues have Nux, B-Boxers, Gigabit Bricks, all these little lightweight units of hardware. They make great little test hypervisors, building test beds. I can go in and run, say, my laptop as an OpenStack controller, and these as the, the compute resource, and have a, a reasonable lab environment up and running really, really rapidly, just to prototype, just to do a proof of technology or try something out. And here's something else that's cool. Hopefully, I won't knock my uh, voice pack off. This is the 32 gig USB 3 key. Fits in my laptop. Almost no profile. I actually put a little dongle on it, because otherwise I'm on the verge of losing it. I've got a full implementation of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 on this. And the way I've done it means I can walk into almost any data center, to almost any piece of equipment, and boot it, and have a fully running working environment. And then using this, which is just an external hard drive caddy that happens to have a 128 gig SSD in it, run a cloud environment on a piece of customer's hardware in their data center. Really low profile. I'm not changing their kit, but I can show stuff off for them. That's really powerful. That's effectively the cloud in my pocket. So I've got that plugged into my laptop here, running OpenStack. So, hardware. So for the purposes of showing this off and my typical work environment, the question is what do you use? If your primary environment of choice happens to be Apple-centric, please try and run a real operating system on it. Okay, these babies will run Linux. Trust me, I've been doing it for a long time. In fact, the very first piece of hardware I ran Linux on was a pre-production Power Macintosh. I ran MK Linux, which was an interesting journey. Then I ran Yellow Dog. So Linux will work on the, this hardware. Now, my environments, I work for Red Hat, we use Red Hat Enterprise Linux. My laptop, I tend to use Fedora on. I want to play with what's coming next from the community. For those of you who need uh, a community-centric choice, go ahead and use CentOS. It's a great environment to do some quick prototyping from within the community. Most of what I'm talking about, though, you can easily reuse with other distributions. CentOS, Ubuntu, Arch, whatever your distribution of choice is, please go and use it. So for the purposes of this today, I'm running Fedora 23 on my laptop. It's got about 12 gig of RAM. Internally, it's got a 256 gig SSD, but I'm usually well out of space. So for a lot of my demos, I use this external drive. And as I just said, the benefit of the external drive means I can use that memory key, and I can go and boot the customer's hardware as well. What I'm going to show off today is actually showing the same kind of implementation, both using Red Enterprise Linux and our recent release of RHEL OSP 8, as well as using RDO, our community build of OpenStack, on top of CentOS. Now, along the way, there will be a few dragons. You know, we all know the term, there may be dragons. You know, a warning, my mate Smog. This is actually in Wellington Airport. You have to walk past this to get on your plane. 
Ain't that cool? He's huge, honest. They'll take up the entire wall in here. So there will be a few pointers, things you really shouldn't do. Please don't have the same pain points I've been through. So the first topic is about nesting. How many in the room have played with nested virtualization? Cool. It's really, really useful. Nesting. Nesting is important. Ah, I love nesting. Uh, we get lots of birds in our garden in New Zealand. It's really, really neat. So one thing about nesting is it gives you this huge benefit over straight QEMU software-based uh, virtualization. So if you're going to enable nesting, now all these slides will be available. So if there's technical nitty-gritty in here you want, all this is copy and pasteable, slides will be available. So if you're on Intel hardware, there's quite a few options you can enable now. Many of these give you interesting optimizations if you're running on Xeon class hardware. If you have a laptop that you're actually able to turn on all of these, please give me the model number. I'd really like one. Um, my little AMD test bed at home, I just simply set that option. You can unload the module, reload it. Things should be good. Ideally, I recommend just doing a reboot just to be certain. And then you should have nested virtualization, hardware accelerated virtualization nesting enabled. Now, when you're playing around with this, use your SSDs. Don't do this on spinning rust. You're going to have a world of pain, particularly when you start playing with thin snapshots, thin uh, LVM. Really simple test is HD Palm. HD Palm will check that your hard drive is just working correctly. A given SSD should be getting something in this range or above. And if you're talking about spinning rush, you'll be down around 100 megabytes a second. I've had strange cases where external hard drives get cranky and drop back down to USB 2 mode, and then all bets are off and your demo's just going to really suck. So that's a real simple test. The moment you plug the drive in, just run that. You know you're actually going to get the, the performance you expect. Uh, I have, I've got a colleague who's really funny about these things. He's, he's like, oh, why don't you use eSATA? Why don't you use Firewire? These days, for purposes of demo, trying things out, USB 3 is usually more than sufficient. So nested virtualization, I'll create an initial uh, VM. You could do it on the command line. I usually just use Vert Manager. And then I'll go and use Versha to edit the configuration and just turn on VMX. Right. Usually you need to just make sure you're giving it the right CPU type as well, uh, depending on your environment. But VMX is enough to mean that when that VM starts up, it thinks it's hardware and you'll get much better virtualization performance. Yeah? Uh, so, yeah, if you're on an AMD hypervisor, so one thing's under Vert Manager, if you're using that, is you can say copy the specification of your native processor. Uh, if you're moving things around a lot, like I want to be able to dump the XML configuration from this and use it somewhere else, that's going to be kind of awkward. So sometimes you might go for a, a low common denominator. One reason I've got Nahalem in this was another gotcha at one point with Kilo. There's something really weird with certain classes of Intel processors, so I actually had to downgrade the machine class. So, so yeah, you just watch that. It's, a, it's something you may need to tweak is the CPU class, particularly if you're working in a, uh, a mixed environment. You may need to downgrade everything to a common baseline. First big gotcha is watch your default networks. Uh, one way around this is spin up your guest environment that you're doing the nesting in in something other than the standard default uh, liver network. Because 192.168.122 will also be the network range in your guest. And the moment you try and do any virtualization, your guest will fail to start up. And if you don't check this, you'll go through the whole process. You'll install OpenStack. You're going, everything looks good. You're going to deploy your virtual machine, and it won't start. And debugging it is a complete pain. It's not obvious, but it's simply that you've got a clash of networks. So either create yourself a new default network on your laptop, your hardware, or create a second network zone that you want to demo in, or just change it in your base image. Now, I use thin LVM a lot because it basically it means that that external hard drive kind of looks like many, many terabytes of space. I can spin up many instances. 
as long as I manage it carefully. So again, a few pointers if you're using thin. So thin LVM, first thing, create a thin pool. Now, one aspect of LVM now is you can set it to auto extend a thin pool if it gets full. So you might say, I'm only going to use so much because spare space on the hard drive and I'll let it expand and consume that over time. But you create a thin pool within an existing volume group. So it's fairly simple now, I create an 80 gig thin pool actually on my local laptop. Whereas in the case of the external drive, I've consumed the entire drive. All it is is one big thin pool. And then I can create a image within that thin pool that has a virtual disk size of 40 gig. So there's one for RHEL or CentOS, depending on your environment of choice. I can then plug that disk in as the disk within uh, Libvirt and then start installing my environment. Couple of gotchas to watch for. When you're using LVM and SSDs, it's critical that you can pass down disk card. Otherwise, you're not actually uh, uh, using your SSD properly, right? Um, you're not doing trim, right? So you need to pass disk cards down for trim to work. Otherwise, you can have interesting side effects. You're not getting the lifetime you expect out your SSD. So that's the first thing. As, at Red Hat, we run um, Lux encryption on our laptops. So doing thin on LVM, on an encryption, and you want to pass trim all the way down, was interesting. And this is the thing I actually managed to get fixed when I was at Linux Conf U earlier this year. Turns out Christopher Smart, who works in the Oslabs team at IBM, actually blogged about this. I was referencing his, his blog on stage saying, I haven't got it working, and this hand goes up at the back. He's actually in my talk. So we went to the back, and it turned out, didn't work in Fedora 21, but it works in 23. So what you do is you configure in your crypt tab, lux uh, comma discard, and then you rebuild the init using Dracut. Next time you reboot, trims pass through. Things behave nicely. OK, all about that base. I'm going to end up giving you all kinds of weird songs stuck in the back of your mind. Right, so what does your base image look like? Think about your workloads. If I'm divine, helping a customer define their SOE, their standard operating environment, I want small. I want really small starting point for them to do, run their business on. And then they'll layer up through configuration management tools like Puppet or Ansible or Satellite the various business applications they want to do. But this is for my purposes as demo. So it doesn't have to be uber, uber small. It just has to be enough for me to run a range of workloads. Now, the workloads I'm predominantly targeting now are running OpenStack, running OpenShift, running things like Docker and Kubernetes, and trying out things like our OpenSCAP security framework. So I want a, an environment that can kind of suit all of those things. So I'll have one for RHEL, one for CentOS. You might have one for other flavors of Linux. I occasionally have one for Fedora as well, if I'm playing with something quite uh, bleeding edge. And I need to update that base regularly, because everything's forked off it. If it's not patched, then every time you create a snapshot, you're patching them. And your use of your disk just grows exp exponentially. And one big thing, think about how you're going to build that base image. Again, there will be dragons. Um, when I was setting up, last week and running some tests, because we happened to drop new builds of Metaka into RDO, and OSP8 came up. I went and deleted one of my base images by accident. Wrong command line, gone. About 20 minutes later, it was back, kickstart, all good. So I highly recommend use kickstart. If you have tools like satellite at your uh, business, use things like that, but have a way of recreating your baseline. And the other useful thing is I can give that kickstart to my customers. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing proprietary about it. It's a useful way to start an environment. So think about your use cases. Don't skimp. Give it a decent size. I'm using thin, so it doesn't matter if the base image is 40 gig, because really on disk, I'm using two. And then I have a few reusable snippets. I'm going to share some of these with you and a couple of tips about the kickstart. So if you're using an environment for something like RHEL OSP, or, or uh, RDO, and using tools like Packstack, which is a great way to prototype or try something out quickly, then um, it's good to reserve some space for Cinder. So I need a volume group 
for Cinder to consume. So I actually defined two volume groups, one for my base OS and my root file system, and one for Cinder volumes. Now, any of you who do Linux in the enterprise probably have standards around separating slash home, separating var, making certain things read only. This is a crash and burn environment. It never lasts more than a day or two, and I'm destroying it and recreating it. So I don't want to overcomplicate it. Small-ish, minimal-ish. So this is my standard set of packages here. For what I'm doing, I don't need Network Manager. It gets in the way when you're trying to do OpenStack. Uh, I turn on virtualization because most of the time that's one predominantly using. So that's my kind of baseline of packages. And then I have a couple of simple snippets. One is I always inject my SSH key into every image that I build. So straight away, I can SSH in as root, which is great for using tools like Ansible or just going in and, and configuring an environment. I turn on the yum cache because I live in New Zealand. Our internet pipes aren't that great. Particularly if I'm building demos at home, I want to hammer my internet connection. So what I do is turn on the yum cache, then I can R sync the packages off and reuse them. I'll go through that in a minute. The last thing is a gotcha. For some reason, Kickstart doesn't like volume group names that have a dash in it. Packstack expects Cinder dash volumes to be the volume group it's looking for. So I just fix that up at the end. And so I bake that into my Kickstart. So this is now completely repeatable. Anytime I want, I can blow that image away, the base image, and recreate it. Now, for those of you who are Red Hat customers, you need to entitle the base. You need to put a subscription on it. So if you're doing this with RHEL, subscription manager, register the system. Now, at Red Hat, I get access to a ridiculous number of content repositories. So the first thing you do is disable everything because I really don't want to try and install stuff out of an SAP repository and I have a high availability repository and I have, X, you know, just gets crazy. So pretty much you need very few channels as standard on a Red Hat system and then patch it, right? Patch the base and then consider it done for now, for this week, for this month until some point you go back and repatch it. Power tip, I mentioned earlier, I've turned on yum caching, so I'll R sync everything off when I'm done. And usually when I'm doing something new, I might R sync everything back in again. I've got a little content cache on my laptop. For those of you who want to go a bit further, what I'm doing now is actually I'm using create repo to create a local yum repository. And then I'm just injecting a yum configuration. So I'm able to build the environment again really rapidly. 90% of what I need, 95%, in fact, yeah, I had to pull a few things down this morning. Just come straight off my laptop. And if you're in a commercial enterprise environment, you can use tools like Satellite or the Upstreams, Catello and Foreman. Need a lot more storage? I don't have it. Hopefully my one terabyte SSD arrives in the post today before I have to go home. Then I'll have enough room. All right, so patch the rel environment. I'll do my little rsync, yum upgrade. I'll move everything back. Good to go. Case of CentOS, um, one thing I've got here is that all I'm syncing are the specific uh, content repositories that I want because I actually have a lot of other demos I do, so I don't want to pull everything in. Whereas in the case of CentOS, <coughs> excuse me, all I'm ever demoing is RDO predominantly, so it has everything I need under that tree. Thin base. Right, we're trying to be on a thin environment. We want the base to be nice and thin and trim. You know, I like pizza. I lived in Italy for a year. I like thin pizza, none of this Chicago, Detroit. You know, pizza should look thin, crispy. I have a wood-fired pizza oven at home. I do good pizza. If you're in New Zealand, look me up. We'll do pizza. It's all good. All right? So first of all, clean up your VM. Yum clean all or just yum clean packages. Clean all will get rid of all the extra yum metadata. We're just freeing up some disk for our starting point. And then you want to transition this. How many of you have used uh, FS Trim? Anyone know FS Trim? Any of you use KPartX? KPartX is cool, right? KPartX will take an environment that's like a virtual disk, allow you to mount it through loopback intelligently so that you can do things and play with the environment. So KPartX, mount my CentOS environment to uh, 
as a, a, a additional dev mapper devices. I'll then mount the first partition, which is slash boot, into month volume. I'll run FS trim on it, free up a little bit of space. All right, unmount it, then mount. So there's LVM inside that environment. So that LVM's now been picked up. That VG's been picked up. So I'll mount the, from the VG CentOS 7, the root partition. I'll run FS trim. Unmount it, make sure you um, disable the VG and then run kpartx minus D. Otherwise, you're leaving lingering dev mapper devices and you go and start your VM up and you may end up getting corruption because of your local environment. It doesn't end well. Now, Vert Manager and Thin, it can't manage existing Thin volumes. If you look, if you're using the Vert Manager GUI to set this up, you won't see your Thin volumes. It doesn't understand them. But if you go in to add the path in, you go, oh, add disk, you can type the path in. Great. Remember my mate? He'll burn your ass. He really will. Doesn't end well. Don't manually enter the path. The moment you do that, it says, oh, I don't know about this. It deletes the one that exists that you've just now spent the last half hour, hour, whatever, curating, and creates a brand new empty one that isn't thin. So use Versha. Go and edit the config. Insert your disk then you're good to go. Better yet, do discard inside your VM. Turtles all the way down, right? Get this right, you can discard inside the VM onto thin, and then discard all the way down to your disk. All right, so there's a few little tips here. One is make sure your machine type in your virtual machine definition is greater than 2.1. It doesn't quite work. Um, I moved a couple of VM images over to this as a, a test before this session, and they were originally uh, 2.1. When I bumped up the machine type to 2.4, everything started behaving. On the, for each of your hard drives, you need to set discard equal unmap, and you need to set the drive type to SCSI for, rather than normal vert IO block. Now, one nice thing about this is that when you do an install of RHEL or CentOS, is that when Dracut creates the initRD, it actually inserts both uh, drivers. So you don't have to go and rebuild a disk image because, you know, like in the old days, you were missing a SCSI driver or something. No, you can get away with this. So you need to change the disk type to SCSI, but you will then get a SCSI controller up here. You need to set the SCSI controller type to the IO SCSI. Once you've done that, behaves nicely, thin all the way down. Don't need to do stuff externally, I can just run FS trim inside my guests. Right, the really easy way, boot your VM, LS block with these options will show disk max greater than zero, that means FS trim's behaving, so I can now trim inside my VM. Okay, but I wanna make sure you know about kpartex as well, really useful tool. Snapshots, so now I've got thin volume, I've got my baseline, I need to do something with it. So, you're doing this, it's great on SSDs. I'm not seeing a major performance loss, not overall, what can you compare where I'm actually getting out of an SSD? And it means I can create off the same base multiple images, multiple environments, try things out. Also, it means I can layer things up. So, I've got my baseline, I've done some, an install of uh, Red Hat OpenStack 8, or I might have installed RDO, and now I wanna go and play with networking, I wanna try something out, so I'll snapshot where I am. Um, if any of you have got a QES support working with QEMU guest, I wouldn't mind having a chat with you about that. Otherwise, yeah, you've got to power the VM off, take a snapshot, bring it back up again. Hell, the VM start up in a few seconds. And I keep lots of notes, which means it's easier to write these decks. One thing about Thin, if you're using it on a Fedora environment or a modern distro, Thin doesn't auto-activate. This is actually a really good thing. Right. I might be doing this in the office. I've got my external laptop plugged into my dock, and I've got to go to a meeting. And I've suddenly got 20 thin environments active, and I go and unplug my laptop and walk away, leaving the hard drive on my desk. Yeah, that's one of the dragons, right? You may need to go and rebuild a few things. So really easy, LV change, main, minus AY activate, minus K forces it to activate, where it's been disabled, but it'll only be active for that use case, it won't stay on next time you reboot, you'll need to reactivate it. 
It is a lifesaver. So don't consider it a bad thing, it's a good thing. So, good, let's build a cloud. Woo so, um, start my VM. Now this is out of some of the standard pack stack install notes. If you happen to have left Network Manager there, get rid of it straight away. Switch back to traditional networking. If this is uh, um, OpenStack 8, you now need to enable the extras repository as well as the standard uh, OpenStack 8 repositories. If you're doing this on CentOS, again, make sure you disable Network Manager. Then I'll go and pull in my content cache I'll sync everything in from my local hard drive, or, as I mentioned earlier, I'll use my local YUM repository that I've created with Create Repo. All right, this speeds things up dramatically. So, Red Hat OpenStack platform, our latest release. So, I love doing these things. It's really great when on the Thursday, before I fly out on Friday, we do an entirely new product release. Turns out it wasn't that difficult. I'll explain why in a minute. So, Packstack is a real simple way to play with OpenStack. It's great for users and it's great for operators to just stand up a micro all in one environment or something with just a few pieces of tin. There's no HA at the controller layer, there's no use for complicated architectures. You want to do this in anger, look at Red Hat Director, look at the tooling that we've got now using things like Triple O using things like Ironic to do this properly, to find a proper architecture. But to, to dip your toe in the water, pack stack, great. So minus minus cinder dash volumes create equal n, means it will actually look for the LVM backing store. And then when I'm done, I pull all the changes back so that next time I've got everything that's come down. I've got a modern repo. Reboot, all good to go. RDO. Very, very similar. We go a point at the latest RDO uh, repository release. Effectively the same command line. And again, I'll sync everything back so that I'm not going online next time and pulling down a, heart, a ton of content. I like to keep lots of notes. Use something to refer back to. I prefer trying to keep digital notes where possible. My tool of choice is a tool called Track. I have one for stuff I do for uh, at home, for private stuff. I have one for notes for all of the uh, test beds and demos and things I do as part of my role at Red Hat. So I can reference all the different versions of OpenStack I've tried to deploy. If I am playing with a beta release, I can go and easily keep notes about my bugzillas, everything else I've got open. Also make sure you learn on modern distributions, particularly Fedora, CentOS, and RHEL, uh, firewall command. Um, all, all the support for firewall D. It's a much cleaner and simpler way of interacting with IP tables. Um, I've had cases playing with some of the beaters where not all of the firewall rules have been automatically set up by Packstack, so I couldn't actually get into the environment once it had started up. So if I can just go. So what I've got here, this is what my hard drives look like. The Fedora underscore volume group is all my local hard drive. The VRHT volume group is on the external. You can see just how many different images and things I've got on this. Uh, you look at the bottom of my thin pool on the external, I'm running at 58% use. And the thin pool on my internal, I'm currently running at 32% use. All right. Get maximum use out of my environment, lots of different demos, trying things out, all built off the same baselines. Now, originally I was going to show you something else, but um, the internet connection here hasn't been as reliable for me, so I had to build some stuff back at the hotel. But my uh, environments, of course, are in New Zealand date, but I actually rebuilt the CentOS environment uh, a few hours ago when I was in the hotel. So that's a CentOS 7 RDO environment, and that's a RHEL uh, 7, RHEL OSP 8, so Red Hat OpenStack 8 environment that was just built a few hours ago. So they're active and running right now. In fact, if I do, just remember the, I need that. I want 
four, eight. The other one was one eight two. So there's um, Red Hat OpenStack 8, latest release. And this one's just coming up with the RDO build, which is a more vanilla OpenStack environment. So they're fully enabled, up and running. I can go and start some workloads up on them. So they were just built just before I came in here. Um, I did consider having them build while I'm on stage, but building RDO and OSP8 simultaneously while presenting not really good thing to do to my laptop. Okay. Let's come back here. So what's the big difference? So OpenStack, Red Hat OpenStack platform, our commercial enterprise ready, hardened, tested. This is what we do with all the vendors that are here this week. RDO is a great way for the community to interact with that process. It's effectively our Fedora to our RHEL. That's the best way to think about it. So the process is upstream, RDO builds almost straight away. In fact, the RDO release was out within a few hours this time, almost, of upstream GAing. And then we'll take time to get OpenStack platform ready. And this is really critical because we've got things like ETS, Etsy defining things like OpenNFE. Open uh, we've got Open Daylight. We've got a lot of innovation going on, in the, and this is a great way to feed things down into the process. So, where am I? I can document things. I can blow things away. I patch my environments regularly. I can re-image easily. I don't use a lot of internet traffic. My life is easy. My life is good. But what I should be doing is automating this. Seems ridiculous, you know. Uh, what I've basically walked you through is a desk procedure to achieve an endpoint. And we bought this thing recently. Anyone heard of Ansible? It's really nice at automation. So if you remember anything, just go there. That's my playbook for doing this, or for doing the core part of this. So Ansible playbooks are really quite nice and, and, and human readable. So a few things in this. Repo host defines where my local yum repository is, so that's easy to change. Now, this isn't great Ansible, but it's a starting point. It's just a way to look at this. I've got it configured so I can do this either on CentOS or RHEL, and either way it will then choose RDO or RHEL OS Red Hat OpenStack platform. The second bit here is I actually define local repo and local OpenStack repo. And again, they'll inject uh, two yum config files so that I make sure I pick up my local uh, content cache. And then at the end, I do the pack stack command. It's all good to go. Now, I was going to show you the output of this from running in a terminal, um, but I lost power coming in here. So I've, I've got to show you an archive I've got of running it uh, a few weeks ago. So for a giggle, I created the playbook, I create a host file that specifies both my RHEL 7 environment and my CentOS environment. I ran the same Ansible playbook on both environments simultaneously on my laptop. Yeah, I ran out of IOPS at some point, but it went through, checked the environments, installed the repositories, ran Packstack, got to the end, and confirmed that both environments were up and running. At that point, I could point a web browser like I've just done at both environments, and they were usable. Right? So if you do anything, go and pull my uh, Ansible playbook. If you've got feedback, tips and tricks, really happy. Now, we're running long on time, so I'm going to skip a couple of things. Where are 
come back. So some people said, well, why you why use LVM? Why don't you just use QCow? QCow supports thin, does snapshots, does all these really neat things. I know, I really like LVM for this kind of use case. I understand what it's doing on the disk. Um, I tend to use QCow for using things like Relatomic, which is our nice little micro environment for playing with Kubernetes and Docker. It's, it's kind of got everything already in there. Do any of you use Cloudinit on a regular basis? So there's a number of you who haven't. Right, there's a really nice simple guide up on the, the Red Hat portal on how to do this. It, it's you know, Noddy Beginners 101, but it's enough to get yourself started. You need two meta files, one to inject your host name, one to inject things like your SSH keys and other details. I say these, this is all gonna be available. Then you create an ISO off that metadata, and then you can use, um, you then attach that to a VM. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the standard Atomic instance from Red Hat. You can get a CentOS Atomic, you can get a Fedora Atomic, the great ways to play with, with Docker and Kubernetes. So I'm gonna create a snapshot off that baseline image using QEMU, and then using Vert install, I'm gonna spin up a new VM with some RAM vCPUs, point it at the ISO image, and that will now start it up and inject my credentials. At that point, I can SSH into that instance. It's all good to go, all right? One neat thing about this is I can reinitialize that base image. I don't need to reinitialize that CD-ROM. My virtual environment still exists in LibVirt, so I can blow that image away, recreate it, and go back to a baseline any point in time. I can also snapshot that snap. So if I'm partway through a lab or trying something out, I can stop everything, do a snapshot, and then carry on. But please don't snapshot it while it's running it will burn you at both ends. It will destroy your base image and the image you're creating, all right? So don't snapshot a running snap unless you've got the ability to quiesce the image. So if you wanna get involved and look at containers, this is a great entry point. A lot of things are taken care of for you. And these are some really good examples, really good walkthroughs. These are on our public website. They're publicly published articles. So quick way of standing up a couple of Docker images and then pulling them together with Kubernetes to create an environment. Right, you can do this on top of RHEL, try it out with Atomic. So where are we? You know, I said earlier about you know, things that bug me that really should be bugging me enough to make a difference. One thing that's bugging me in the data center is this. You know, how many of you have to deal with UEFI on a regular basis now? If you're not, and if you're, you're dealing with still hardware in the data center, you're gonna to have to learn this, you're gonna to have to understand this. All your new hardware is UEFI. Now, one of the things around this is I'm trying to pretend I'm hardware. So to do that, I need to basically make my virtual environment do EFI. What I'm doing right now is effectively old style BIOS based boot. You can do it, but it's not very well integrated right now. There's some licensing issues around shipping all the UEFI components as standard as part of your distro. So there's a couple of guides out there, but when I do it, what I want to effectively do is redo everything, which is easy, because it's just kickstart-based, I can recreate everything. But I want to do it so that everything's secure boot, that it feels like a data center. I'm getting closer and closer to what my customers are really doing. So to help me along with that, that USB key is UEFI ready. Now there's a few ways of doing this, but A, you need to create an ISO or USB key you can install from that's UEFI ready. So you can uh, use live ISO to disk and specify EFI. Most of the modern install ISOs are EFI ready. So you can just dump them on a USB key and boot a piece of hardware. Make sure you force, and I mean force, I mean brute force the hardware to boot in EFI only. I've seen hardware in the data center that will do everything it can to go back to MBR BIOS style installation methods and suddenly you find your environment isn't EFI friendly, you get no secure boot. Which comes back to my world of crazy, things I love doing because it's just, well, it's me anyway. So uh, what I wanted was a full RHEL 7 install on here, like a lot, not a live environment with an overlay. This is a real running environment. It thinks it's a hard drive. But I want it to boot both on a BIOS-based old-style piece of hardware and on a UEFI system. So a couple of pointers. The RHEL 7 install, you need to leave a little bit of space. Make sure you install it in UEFI mode, otherwise you won't get the EFI partitions. 
you won't get the other things you need to support UEFI environments. Then you need to create an additional partition with Parted that's uh, tagged as BIOS Grub because that's where Grub will actually install all the bits it needs to boot on a traditional BIOS environment. Then install Grub 2, but you haven't actually configured it properly. Then I need to basically mess around, use a live environment to boot into legacy and rescue mode, uh, to mod in, and then configure Grub 2. Once that's done, it will boot either way, and it will survive kernel updates and everything. So it's smart enough to update Grub both ways, the one inside the EFI environment and the Grub2 environment. So I can update this no matter which way I boot. So next, what am I going to do next? What's my next pain point? So I want to rework my kickstarts I mentioned earlier. I want to make better use of Ansible in this. The Ansible I've got up there, some of it's quite simplistic. There's a few things some of the Ansible modules are, are missing right now. Uh, I have a feeling I'm going to have to do a patch for upstream to just give it a few extra features. Um, I'm thinking maybe because I use this for a lot of different use cases, maybe I should turn encryption on. Um, that might be a good thing. I, I almost have a fully um, Ansible driven Kubernetes atomic Docker demo to go. Just needs a few tweaks on the road, not had a chance. The one thing I really want to play with though is this because ARM's coming to the data center. So I want to be able to do everything I've just talked you through, but I want to do it on ARM. I've been using ARM since the mid-90s, and you're going to see a lot more about this. And I've been talking to the IBM team. I like power as well. As I mentioned earlier, I first ran Linux on, on PowerPC. So power's another important architecture. There's more to life than x86. So that's my story. I hope you've all learned something. I hope someone in the room has a tip or trip trick for me that something I haven't done before. Que any questions? Stunned silence. The slides will be available. I hope it was useful and thank you all for coming. <laughs>